pardon them and show good cheer until a law brings about his order. So that doesn't mean that it's abrogated by the I in Surah Tawbah, the ninth Surah, I 29. It means that it has a specific application for specific times. There'll be some times where you pardon the people of the book for certain things that have happened or what have you, and certain times where it would be necessary where they'd have to be fought. An example would be this one. When the companions took control of Armenia, Armenia, they are Orthodox Christians. <coughs> the Armenians were paying jizya. The companions were summoned back further westward. And they told the Armenians, we are no longer able to protect you under our realm. You now must defend yourselves in your own interests. And they gave the money that they had taken from the jizya back and they left. Because the question that comes to people's minds often, it will come up again in Surah the Tawbah, the ninth Surah 29, is what is the money used for jizya? What is the purpose of it? The jizya secures, the ulama say, the following principles. People of the book from among the Jews and Christians are not required to fight in the military of the Muslims, if the Muslims are invaded, they are not required to pay Zakat al Fitr or the Khiraj tax on the Zakat tax on land that they have, and that the Zakat cannot be, that the, excuse me, the jizya is not levied on women, children, rabbinical authorities, ecclesiastical authorities, these are Christian authorities, ecclesiastical authorities, and monks and abbots. Because monks and abbots and these such type of people, they wouldn't be able to pay it because they have to take the three vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity. They don't have the money to pay it. So why would you impose jizya on a people that can't pay it because they have no money? So they were not responsible for paying it. Now the money that goes into the jizya, that goes into the Bayt al Mal, the treasury of the Muslims, is more often than not used by the Muslims for reparation and upkeeping of buildings in the Christian and Jewish areas. The reparation of their synagogues. The upkeep of their municipal buildings. The upkeep of the schools, the outer structure of their schools, the upkeep of their wells, their drinking water, their aquifers, their aqueducts. These are some of the purposes of the jizya. Not all, but some of the purposes of the jizya. And if you should look at history, the Jewish golden age is not now when there's a state of Israel. According to the Jews, when there's a state of Israel, there's all these things going on. According to Jewish and secular authorities, the Jewish golden age was under the Muslims in Baghdad and in Spain when they were paying jizya. That's where Rabbi Moshe bin Maimon penned all of his books, Nachmanides, all the different Jewish scholars that are known historically, that's where they penned their books, was under the Muslims paying jizya. So if it was as wicked as people claim, the Islamic poll tax, as they call it. If it was as horrific and devastating as they claim, then why were there so many rabbis? There are more rabbis under the so-called Muslim poll tax than there are today. And if you really looked at it, Rabbi Ovadai Yusuf, when asked about this issue, said that the Jewish people are, in most cases, better off paying the jizya than under liberal secular democracies and he cited the holocaust the exterminations under the russian revolutions and similar other incidents that occurred as proof to establish his point we as muslims aren't perfect but we have a lot of transgressions but one thing we don't do is go around slaughtering people and putting them in ovens so as the muslims spread the jizya that's one of the principles one of the principles. Imam al-Jawzi, he then says, quote, 
And the exalted one has said, and establish the prayer, give the zakah. Whatever good you send forth from yourselves, you will find it in the sight of Allah. Allah sees all of what you do. So when Allah the exalted says you will find it, it means that you will find the reward of what was said. Now, Allah has said, and they said, none shall enter the paradise except the one who is a Jew or a Christian. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said, the Jews were disputing one day in Medina, and the Christians were disputing as well, both in front of the Prophet sallallahu And they began to dispute over a particular matter with regard to their religions. And then Allah had revealed. And so the Jews say the Christians are upon nothing. And the Christians say the Jews are upon nothing. Yet they're both reciting from that book. Likewise, those who don't know have said similar to their statement. Allah shall judge between them on the day of resurrection and that which they had differed in regarding the matter. And who is more oppressive than the one who hinders masajid Allah, who should hinder from the masjids of Allah, that his name should be mentioned therein, and they move in quickness to try to destroy them. These people and what they have, they shall not enter there except in a state of fear and trembling. They have in this life humiliation and in the hereafter a great punishment indeed. To Allah belongs the East and the West. So wherever you turn, there is Allah. Indeed, Allah is encompassing and all-knowing. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat 113 to 115. So, when Allah had said this, the Jews and the Christians were disputing. The Jews of Medina and the Christians of Najran were disputing in front of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, And the Jews said, the Christians are upon nothing. None shall enter the paradise unless such a one is a Jew. And they rejected the Injil and Isa. And the Christians said, the Jews are upon nothing. And they disbelieved in the Torah and Musa. So Allah said, these are their vain desires. You should know that the words in this ayah are general. The meaning of the statement when the Jews say, none shall enter the paradise except that he's a Jew, or none should enter, or when the Christians say, none shall enter the paradise except that they are a Christian. It's referring to their particular beliefs. The word Jew, hud, plural, is the singular of this word is ha'id. When Allah says those are their vain desires, meaning that's something that they wish. And that's something that they think and suspect. 
And this is the understanding of the statement of Ibn Abbas and Mujahid. When it said to them, say, bring your proof if you're truthful, meaning bring your evidences. If you are truthful that none shall enter the paradise except whoever is a Jew or a Christian. Then Allah clarified that the matter is not at all like what they say. When Allah said about this matter, Indeed, whoever submits himself to Allah and he is worshipping Allah as if he sees him, then he has his reward in the sight of his Lord. There is no fear upon them, nor shall they grieve. So the meaning of when he submits, it has to do with purification. And the word wedge, when it says he submits his wedge in this ayah, one point that it's referring to is the deen. Two is his actions. The muhsin means that he's a muhsin in his actions. He is worshipping Allah as if he sees him in his actions. And he, have, he has his reward. It means that such a person that belongs to that category is entering the paradise. Close quote. Now, when Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, when the imam is referring to this, we need to make sure to understand that the word wedge in Arabic can mean a number of different things. Wedge in Arabic can mean face, the physical face. Wedge can mean the core of something. Wedge can mean a particular political position or a theological, uh, a theological influence someone has. But in this case, wedge is referring to deen. وَمَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ Whoever submits his deen and his actions to Allah, and he worships Allah as, as if he sees him, then his reward is in the sight of his Lord, they shall have no fear upon them, nor shall they grieve. All right, because this is the principle that's being given. So when the Jews are saying, no, you're not going to enter the paradise unless you're Jewish, and the Christians say, well, you're not going to enter the paradise unless you're Christians, why is this statement being negated? Because someone could say, well, the Muslims are saying, you're not entering the paradise unless we're Muslims. So why is, why, is, why, are, why is that different when the Jew and Christian saying it? Well, here's why. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, no, no soul shall enter the paradise unless it, is, unless it is a Muslim soul. That's the first point, the hadith and the sahih of a Muslim. But number two, there's another point that needs to be kept in mind and remembered. And it's this. The religion that they're calling Judaism is a conglomeration and collection of traditions that came out of and were finally collected and summarized from the late first temple period up until 200 BC where the word Yehudiot was first mentioned. So when you speak to the ultra-Orthodox rabbi, the Haridi rabbi, and you say prior to the accretions that you picked up in Babylon, the other things, what was your religion called in the religion of all the prophets before you mentioned the word Yehudiot or Jew? What was, what was that religion? There isn't one. Similarly, Christianity. The word Christian did not appear until Antioch in the late first or second century. So then they had to say, wait a minute, just a minute. What were they called? What did the Prophet Isa refer to his companions in their faith prior to that time. And this is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rejecting it, saying, no, this is these are their vain desires. Why? Because Yahudiot or Judaism is a religion they constructed. Christianity, or Nasraniyyah, is a religion that they constructed. And so that is why Allah has said, no, the religion that I've revealed is the one, whoever submits himself. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that. Imam ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, he then says, quote, And then Allah says, And the Jews say the Christians are upon nothing, and the Christians say the Jews are upon nothing, yet they are both reciting from that book. Meaning that every one of them is reciting his book by testifying to what he's rejected of. As said by Sudayy and Qatada, as far as the exalted one saying, likewise, those who did who do not know said before. It means that the idol worshippers of the Arabs, they used to say to Muhammad and his companions, "You're not on anything." As Sudayy mentioned this from his sheikhs. Secondly, 
that there used to be nations before the Jews and Christians, like the people of Nuh and Hud and Salih, who said similar deplorable statements that their people of truth were not upon anything. 